Neil Breen is a filmmaker who is starting to generate some serious buzz on the B-movie scene. My name is Cade. I have an identical twin brother, Kale. Then one day it all changed. There was a bright light in the sky and time stood still. We were both selected. After watching all of Neil Breen's films over Easter weekend, I realized that there is a lot of similarities between his movies and the Star Wars prequels. <laughs> <laughs> I think that George Lucas and Neil Breen are very similar people and similar filmmakers, but George Lucas obviously has a lot more money to spend on his fever dream films. Jar Jar is a key to all this. If we get Jar Jar working, because he's a funnier character than we've ever had in any of the movies before. Well, Miss, uh, clumsy. George is also best friends with Steven Spielberg and Francis Ford Coppola, and sometimes they can talk George out of his really terrible ideas. George Lucas had this idea for Indiana Jones, and it was basically, hey, let's do aliens. And I said, George, I don't want to do aliens. I've done two alien movies at the time I had done E.T. and Close Encounters to the Third Kind, not in that order, but I had done both of those pictures. And I didn't want to do any more aliens. That was it. Neil Breen is an architect and real estate agent who works out of the Las Vegas area, and he's created five feature-length films since he started his film career in 2005. He has self-funded and has had full creative control over every single one of his movies. Neil Breen has written, produced, directed, edited, and starred in every single one of his movies. I can't go on with this. I can't go on with this. I'm an American. I'm an American. I love this country. In the industry, he's considered a quintuple threat. The interesting thing about Neil Breen is that he has not improved his filmmaking at all, but takes his films deadly seriously. Hello, my friend. Thank you for giving me peace of mind. According to film festival programmers, Neil Breen does not classify his films as cult or B-movies, and he insists that they be shown at normal showtimes rather than at midnight when they should be shown. Neil Breen has also made a five-hour filmmaking masterclass, This Is Not A Joke, where you can learn how to make movies just like him. Over the past few years, I've been asked a number of questions about my filmmaking process. So I thought I'd take this time to put together what I'm calling a retrospective of how I've been able to do that. His is framed where you're, the center of your attention is his crotch. <laughs> <laughs> and th th it's just like if this was a video about how to win at the stock market, it would be okay. But it's a video of him explaining how to set up shots <laughs> in a movie. I didn't watch it because it cost $200, and Neil Breen doesn't know how to work video on demand services, so he will mail you a physical DVD through the mail, and it takes four weeks to ship. I'll do a lot for a bit, but that's too much. George Lucas is the legendary director of the Star Wars trilogy, and then the notorious director of the Star Wars prequels. In this video, I'll be talking about the prequels because those are the films that George Lucas had the most creative control over, and it truly is a picture to the inside of George Lucas's mind. You wanna buy some death sticks? You don't want to sell me death sticks. I don't wanna sell you death sticks. You want to go home and rethink your life. I want to go home and rethink my life. Again, it's like poetry, it's sort of they rhyme. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Every stanza kind of rhymes with the last one. Hopefully it'll work. Political and social commentary. Neil Breen likes to tackle the big issues in his movies. He hates lawyers, CEOs, stockbrokers, drug lords, and general corruption. We make a fortune at our insurance companies, overcharging customers and hospitals, and there's nothing the customer can do about it. We have the backing of the politicians. Isn't that cheating the public? Neil Breen hates evil, he hates corruption, he wants to talk about it, but he has no idea how evil operates. This is for the politicians. This is for the stockbrokers. George Lucas also likes to comment on politics, but I don't think he has any idea how politics really work. The politics in the prequels are so bafflingly overcomplicated and nonsensical. 
And do not come for me in the comments talking about obscure Star Wars lore and how it all makes sense if you've consumed thousands of hours of Star Wars content. Your 90 minute movie should make sense on its own terms to a general audience. That's kind of the way it goes. A tragedy has occurred which started right here with the taxation of trade routes and has now engulfed our entire planet in the oppression of the Trade Federation. This is outrageous. I object to the Senator's statements. The Chair has not recognized a Senator from the Trade Federation at this time. To state our allegations, I present Queen Amidala, recently elected ruler of the Naboo, who speaks on our behalf. George and Neil both have a lot of principles, but paired with complete naivete around these topics. Both these filmmakers are fascinated with the corruption of the innocent. Neil Breen loves a narrative where someone falls from grace, usually left behind by capitalism, they lost their job or something, and then they descend into a life of despair. I'm so sorry, but due to the poor economy, we're gonna have to lay you off, along with some other staff members. We all had the best of intentions of improving the nation's sustainable energy systems and environment, but the corruption and greed in big business and government just won't let it happen. I can't believe I was laid off. I mean, we were doing some of the most important ecological work with that company. The research we were doing was going to solve everybody's energy problems, and we couldn't get government support. <sighs> They're not going to hire any of us back at this point. And I have this baby. I. How am I going to support her if I'm all alone? Become a stripper! And obviously with George Lucas we have Anakin and Padme, two naive lovers who fall from grace and Padme dies of a broken heart and Anakin becomes Darth Vader. Anakin, all I want is your love. Love won't save you, Padme. Only my new powers can do that. Both Neil and George are hyper-idealistic but very naive and have no self-awareness on how this could be interpreted by a general audience. Terrible dialogue. The dialogue from the prequels have been the fuel of internet memes for, at this point, decades. Are you an angel? What? Yippee! I'll try spinning. That's a good trick. I don't like sand. It's coarse and rough and irritating, and it gets everywhere. I don't think the system works. And not just the men, but the women. And the children, too. Hello there. Master Skywalker, there are too many of them. What are we going to do? So this is how Liberty dies. With thunderous applause. If you're not with me, then you're my enemy. Anakin, Chancellor Palpatine is evil! From my point of view, the Jedi are evil! It's over, Anakin! I have the high ground! It was said that you would destroy this sin, not join them! I'm haunted by the kiss that you should never have given me. Love won't save you, Padme. Only my new powers can do that. It is so on the nose and disjointed, as if George has a lot to say, but cannot channel it into how humans actually talk to each other. Neil Breen also suffers from this flaw. He wants to talk about very human constructs, like power dynamics, corruption, drugs, romance but he can't construct dialogue in a way that doesn't sound like an alien wrote it. We have evidence of the largest cyber and terror attacks ever planned. Programmable DNA. This is very serious. Homeland Security is ready. We are on the verge of mind hacking. In both the prequels and Neil Breen's films, the romance is so weird, the villains are very cartoonish, and the overarching adjective I would use to describe every interaction is awkward. George Lucas does have an advantage here. He has the money where he can hire Hollywood actors to say his terrible dialogue, so it's at least delivered reasonably well. Anakin, you're breaking my heart. You're going down a path I can't follow. Whereas Neil Breen kind of hires random people from the Las Vegas area to say his dog shit lines. CGY. As Neil Breen and George Lucas progressed through their careers, they both started to rely heavily on CGI and green screens. I understand why a lot of movies rely heavily on green screens. 
It's very cheap in the production process to rent out a studio and cover it in green or blue fabric and set up your lights and cameras in a very controlled space. Location work is really difficult, especially outdoor location work, because there's no electricity outside, weather can be very unpredictable, it's tough to get a level ground to set up your camera on. However, the thing with green screens is, unless you really know what you're doing, it can look fake as shit. The lighting between the shot footage and the background has to match, that's very difficult to do. Also, the backgrounds have to be in perspective and also detailed enough that it doesn't look two-dimensional. Also with acting, all the actors' eye lines have to be at the same place and their performances have to match what is happening on screen. For example, Samuel L. Jackson was a very seasoned actor by the time the prequels came around. And where is he running to in this scene exactly? In the prequels, a lot of scenes had to be reshot because the actors' performances and reactions didn't match what was happening on screen and the end result was really bizarre. The, the guy who's creating that character will create their responses off what, how you respond to their responses that aren't there. It's a nightmare. These green screen problems are pervasive in both George Lucas's prequels and Neil Breen's films. Unfortunately, Neil Breen isn't a billionaire and doesn't have a huge special effects company to back him up, so his green screen sequences are god-awful. Lucas loves working with green screens because it allows him to put anything that is in his mind on the screen without the limits of reality. Neil Breen also likes to work in the fantastical. I definitely wouldn't say he makes gritty character dramas. However, this preference is working under the assumption that the raw images coming out of your mind are good, which in both Neil Breen and George Lucas's case isn't always true. Jesus shit. I don't know why people are so obsessed with Jesus. He did one thing like a million years ago and for some reason we can't stop talking about it. Neil Breen and George Lucas are no different. Neil Breen stars as the lead in every single one of his movies and he straight up plays Jesus in every single one. He always plays the super soldier, eco-warrior, AI-enhanced, super genius hacker who dies several times and then comes back to life to save humanity. Bronze Star, the medal for gallantry in action. George Lucas also loves his Jesus content. In a baffling story choice, he made Anakin a virgin birth as his mother was impregnated by midi chlorians. Who was his father? There was no father. He was supposed to be the chosen one, but he died and he came back as evil zombie Jesus Darth Vader. No! Neil Breen and George Lucas are far from the only filmmakers who have worked with this trope. I just wish when filmmakers took on this content, they would go to church once or Google search Jesus, perhaps. Now we're going to dive into a new segment I'm calling Terrace Tangents, where I complain about something more than usual. Today, it's filmmakers using Jesus imagery in movies. <laughs> when you are from a certain background, a white, slightly Christian-y background, you know a lot about Jesus. I didn't grow up religious, but all of my major holidays, like Easter and Christmas, had a lot of Jesus stuff going on. Hello there, internet person. As you can see here, we have the dictionary definition of a wasp in her natural habitat, shouting her opinions on the internet. Other hobbies include bullying people on Twitter and talking about the benefits of socialism while sipping gin and tonics on her parents' country estate. Make sure you like and subscribe in order to continue to feed her massive ego or she will implode like a dying star. The basic Jesus story is that he was a virgin birth, he grew up, he had 12 disciples, one of those disciples betrayed him, and then Jesus let himself get arrested, and he was crucified, and in that he died, and he absolved humanity of all of its sins by dying for them. Three days later, he moved the rock from his tomb, he came out, and he was Lord Jesus Christ, a God amongst men. Hooray! 
So when I see filmmakers using Jesus imagery the wrong way, it really annoys me. Not because I'm religious, but because it's a trope that is so well known by so many people. I have to wonder why you decide to use it in the first place if you're not going to execute it properly or even fully flush out what you're trying to do with it. For example, Neil Breen in this movie has some evil businessmen, some villains, and for some reason he crucifies them. Why? They're not sacrificing themselves for humanity, they're not going to rise from the dead later. Why would you kill them in a way that has so much loaded meaning? Why not just execute them, I don't know, with a gun or a way that made more sense for that character? Why decide to kill them this way? It doesn't make any sense. Other than you just thought it looked cool. When George Lucas uses this trope, he uses parts of it, but then seems to forget that other elements exist entirely. For example, Anakin was a virgin birth. Okay, I can buy that. He rose again as evil Jesus as Darth Vader. Okay, fine. However, he was never an innocent or a good person. He was always really creepy and also killed a bunch of younglings. He never sacrificed himself for anyone. He kind of went mad with the promise of power and then was straight up murdered. So again, this trope doesn't really work for this story. A recent movie that came out that had a lot of Jesus imagery in it was Promising Young Woman. It has some martyr stuff, some crucifix stuff. I kind of understand where the director was trying to go with some of this imagery, but on a foundational level, it just doesn't work. The main character never actually sacrificed herself for anyone. She was also just straight up murdered. She never absolved anyone of their sins. In fact, she did the exact opposite and held people accountable for their sins. And she never rose to become a god amongst men, literally or figuratively, she sent evidence to law enforcement from beyond the grave, and a text message with a winky face in it. The Jesus thing did work in Lord of the Rings. Gandalf the Grey was the leader, he had the fellowship, he sacrificed himself for the fellowship, and then he rose later as a god amongst men, Gandalf the White. I don't have a problem with people taking creative liberties, but when you set up a trope, especially a trope as well known as Jesus, and you make no conscious decision to either follow or subvert expectations of that trope, it doesn't come off as clever, it comes off as lazy. And that's what I have to say about Jesus shit in movies. Overall vibe. The style of both Neil Breen's films and the prequels can be boiled down to one adjective, incoherent. You might be thinking, Tara, of course Neil Breen's movies aren't going to be coherent. He makes B-movies. You are wrong, sir. Most famous B-movies, like Troll 2, Sharknado, The Last Vampire on Earth, The Room, they have very coherent plots. They're just incredibly stupid. In every scene of a Neil Breen movie, and I am not exaggerating, it's impossible to know what's happening. No scene leads into another, no plots are ever resolved, characters appear and disappear for no reason, with no conclusion. Multiple times watching his movies, a character will reappear tens of minutes after being introduced, and I'll think, oh my god, I forgot that character existed. There are so many magical stones, aliens, superpowers, villains, character motivations that aren't set up properly, so these movies have no consistent internal logic. The prequels have the same type of energy for me. Scenes could be in any order, character motivations are really unclear, plots rarely have a satisfying conclusion. It's wild watching the original Star Wars trilogy and comparing it to the prequels, because the original trilogy was so simple and straightforward and had so much forward momentum, whereas the prequels are so convoluted, there's so much sitting and talking, it's hard to remember what actually happens in them. The most memorable thing about those movies is Natalie Portman's costumes, which George Lucas personally designed himself. I mean, this might be okay for Padme. Why don't we put a t-shirt on her? How's that? Okay. My costumes are a little bit more revealing this time. George designed himself. <laughs> the corset was so tight, they made my waist like you know, 20 inches or something. And the comical dialogue, that's also quite memorable. Watching the behind the scenes of the prequels, it's unsurprising that they were so convoluted. George Lucas finished all the scripts during pre-production, and I hear that's a really bad idea when you're making a space opera with a super complicated world. This is it. Kind of cool. This is it. The beginning. I can't believe it. <coughs> and after this meeting, I'll finish reading. I'll finish writing the script. <laughs> <laughs> Why? 
What is my point? So what is my point here? Mostly that George Lucas is a couple of billion dollars away from being a notorious B-movie director. George Lucas's most successful projects have occurred when he's opened up his creative process to more talented people, like Steven Spielberg, Carrie Fisher, or Harrison Ford. Neil Breen needs more talented friends who can talk him out of his crazier ideas and help him hone his vision. I follow Neil Breen on Twitter, and right now he is in pre-production for his sixth feature-length film. I honestly can't wait for another two hours of badly executed Jesus tropes, stilted dialogue, and terrible special effects. And of course, Neil Breen's Oscar-worthy acting. Oh, I, uh, I, I, I guess it's dirt. I think I slept in the ground last night. In the dirt. Anyway, thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe and follow me on Twitch, Twitter, Instagram.